Hello and welcome to Reason T. I'm your host as always, Howard Jones, and joining me of course is my co-host, Miss Kim Lum. Hello. Tonight we continue our re-evaluation of the filmography of Hiro Miyazaki, the head of Studio Ghibli. Uh, tonight our re-evaluation moves on to Howl's Moving Castle, uh, the equally acclaimed follow-up to the Oscar award-winning Spirited Away. And this one's uh, based on the book by Dan Wayne Jones, uh, also the same name. Uh, with voice cast including Christian Bell as the title of Howl, um, in a story which sees a young girl named Sophie who finds herself turned into an old woman and taking on a job as a cleaning woman in the title of Howl, Moving Castle, um, owned by the, the shape-changing wizard Howl and his uh, unique collection of uh, friends. I know you're a fan of this one, Kim. Yes, that I am. <laughs> so what is it about uh, Howl's Moving Castle that uh, that holds such appeal? Because obviously we've already covered my personal favourite with uh, Princess Mononoke, and when it comes to Howl's, um, there was obviously a lot of excitement coming off Spirited Away, and we had the, the a lot of promo art, really, just of the castle itself, and it the general reminder that you know this is all hand drawn animation, so when you actually see it on the finished film and you see this ginormous st- detailed structure that uh, moves and clanks around the landscape of uh, this world, which walks with that tightrope between fantasy and reality, is it's a world which is both engaged in warfare, but at the same time a world where witches and wizards uh, exist. Um, and are currently being called up to the front line by the king of the empire, who wishes to use their powers, which puts uh, Howl into conflict because he's uh, not doesn't agree with the war at all. Um, but yes, what is it about uh, Howl's that you you like so much? I don't know. Maybe it is exactly what you said. It's the the whole castle, um, the whole fantasy. I've always liked the castle a lot. I always thought this is like beautiful, big like. Kind of like rusty looking, funky looking little thing that's going across the land. Um, it's such a cool design. And then on top of that, um, it has to do, I guess, because I wa- actually watch this in... This is the first Miyazaki movie that I watch in theaters in, like, Montreal. <laughs> okay. In an English theater. Um, with English dub first. And... It was really quite the experience because, like you said, the voice cast is, you know, is, is, a, big, is a big selling point for one. Um, but at the same time, like, I knew nothing about Howl's Moving Castle. I've never read the novel before at that point. Um, I have read the novel after that, uh, shortly after I saw the movie because I really liked it. And, and um, in the movie, I remember when I first saw it, and I still feel the same way, is that Howl is probably one of the most handsomest design anime characters ever (laughs) and it's just he's just such a heartthrob you know and 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 then he has this like really contrast in his type of personality because there's like so many sides to this character um that 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 kind of like um break the image of someone who looks like that but at the same time is like declared as like you know the most powerful wizard but at the same time behind doors his personality is like completely different in some ways and there's like one scene specifically that really calls to that so i don't know i just really like the depth of it and there's also you know like with sophie being an elderly woman there's a scene very similar to that of like porco rosso um so it, it it's very you know like it, it's something that i really like there's there's a depth to it that I like, and then there's also the, you know, the characters and, and the dialogue, and um, I'm a big fan of all the characters in it, and when I think about it sometimes, I always put Totoro as my first, like, my favorite movie, and then sometimes I think about it, and I'm like, the amount of times that I rewatch Howl's Moving Castle is, kind of puts it first sometimes. <laughs> Probably need to rethink about that <laughs> list of favorites again. <laughs> So anyway, when you look at this film and the world that it's set within, it's almost as though you can look at the Miyazaki movies and if we remove, for example, if, uh, we remove uh, like, um, oh, uh, Nausicaa, 
from the uh, from the equation. I mean, it's, there's almost like a a lot of world building between several of his films here. When we like look at mm. like Princess Monoki being like the earliest start point, and then we move on to the likes of Kiki's Livery Series, Porco Rosso, and certainly Howl's Moving Castle seems to be within that timeline as well. Mm. Mm. This world, and we see like magic generally fading out, so that by the time we get to like Spirited Away, uh, magic has all been been pushed into the background. Mm. If we look at it, it's like one sort of complete timeline here, and certainly with with Howls, it's moving sees that that line as getting more into the sort of modern world, whereas with the likes of Porco Rosso and um, certainly with Kiki's Living Service Magic and societies do very much side by side, but with House Moving Castle we can see Magic being slowly forced away uh, from as we move, to move towards a, a technology driven world really. And it's that sort of cl- that classic clash, really, because be- where before we've seen like the clash between the environment and industry, here we get to see that sort of almost classic clash between technology and science, which is something that we've seen in numerous other properties before. And it's always sort of interesting when you like look at something like this or Wizards, where or even something like Flight of Dragons, where it's all, which again sees science and going up against magic. And I just so what I love about when you look at Howls, it's sort of like this this small moments of like of magic that that just like exist within the landscape. And certainly, his castle is just this this one small concentrated area of magic. The fact that it's this jangly sort of building just held together by by magic, and we see that when that magic uh, disappears, just how it all collapses. Um, I love all those little touches mm-hmm. here within this and. How I found to be a lot more of a background character than I was expecting. You expect with like Howl's Moving Castle for him to be a much more forthright character, but this is really Sophie's story here. Yes, that is true. Because I, you know, like Sophie is the main character here, and I, I think it's really interesting because I guess you know with Studio Ghibli and stuff like that, you you also have that um, that concept that he is he does lean towards a lot of female protagonists. He does so. Yeah, so this story is like a perfect story for him to um, to adapt. It makes sense in that sense. And if I like, I don't remember the book really well, but um, the biggest difference I think between the book and the book version of Howl's Moving Castle and the movie is how Howl is portrayed. Because Howl in the book is not quite the same, you know, like you know he jokes around and stuff like yeah. that. He's not that type of character. He's a much more like, he's kind of like a, he, I, I rem- if I remember correctly, he was kind of more pretentious in that sense. Like he wasn't so easily, you know, easily approachable, I guess, in that sense. So that was the main thing. Um, but I mean, it, it is nice because, you know, Sophie comes into the picture and she, she has these like, she's a different version to all of his previous characters because, you know, obviously she's now a... Uh, a young girl that's cursed into a elderly woman's body. And now she has all these like new adaptations she needs to know. And, you know, how is she, you know, she has to leave because she can't stay at home. And then she ends up in this place with all these people who all sound like, who, who all act like children. One of the, you know, the young apprentice being actually ch- a child. Right. Um, and everybody has this thing with her where, you know, she's a very commanding type of woman, which she doesn't seem to be um, when she's at home um, doing her, her, you know, running the, the hat shop for her family. Yeah. I think certainly it's almost as though she doesn't just age in, in physical appearance. She sort of ages in spirit as well. So she becomes like a much more more sort of like forthright person. She's almost like she gains all this world experience by turning into an old woman. And she even starts. She even like refers to herself with like this world weariness to her. It's sort of like a sort of like I'm an old woman. It's not like I got this appearance of being an old woman. And we see that uh, when she's around Howl, that she gets this sort of youth. Her, she regains her youthfulness uh, that he sort of like taps into within her. So you see, like 
her facial um, her face is like grow younger and her body is sort of like revert back and then as he moves away she, you see her body like change back into mm-hmm. the elderly woman form which I think is such a nice sort yeah. of touch there it's another strong female character really within a Mozaki work and I mean his his work as you said really just they're very populated with these strong female characters which is never a bad thing and certainly in the case of uh, Sophie it's it's almost comparable to um, Alice, not Alice, um, Dorothy in mm. uh, Wizard of Oz. The fact that she amasses these odd characters and they together form this sort of like alternative family unit. I mean, even from the start, she picks up a, a bouncing scarecrow called Tenniped. Um, yeah. And not only does she like charm her way onto being part of Howl's little group of uh, characters like the fire spirit calcifer and uh the little boy that uh is on on his marco. castle as well marco uh but she also like extends this as well so we get to see the witch of the wasteland who lose originally is set up as this big threat of the film she's the one who turns sophie into an old woman and she loses all her powers so she ends up becoming her actual age and starts suffering from what could almost be seen as dementia yeah um but she also like becomes part of this family and once that happens though the film also loses its major villain and we end up in this like totoro situation where there is no major villain of the piece um and instead we're just watching this this sort of slice of life sort of drama the the, how this little group um a are just dealing with sort of day to day life and um, obviously the impact of this war that's currently raging around him and that the king of the empire is there determined to bring Howl into even though he has no interest in being involved whatsoever which is in many ways a representation of Mosaki and his feelings on the Iraq war and one of the reasons that he decided to actually make the film he wanted to make a film that would be not well received in America, especially with its anti-war, anti-war statements and being a pacifist as well. You can see so much of Murasaki within the character of Howl, certainly in his refusal to be involved in this war when so many of his fellow wizards and witches are being drawn into this conflict. You know, but I mean, the point you made about it being, you know, turning into kind of like a drama Totoro style. Yeah. I kind of disagree because in the sense where your enemy is no longer a, you know, the witch of the waste. And it's a twist because she doesn't, you know, she doesn't remain the witch of the waste. And and that is a very, you know, Wizard of the Oz element. But I mean, I can but at the same time, uh the 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 enemy now has changed because the enemy is now a much more powerful wizard who is working for the king. But she never and, really does anything. She has that yeah, one she never conflict. Does anything, but at the same time, you also have the war. And the war is a much bigger yeah. enemy in that sense, right? It's like a big environmental enemy. And, you know, like, you can argue that about, you know, like, Nausicaa. Is Nausicaa, you know, like... Nausicaa is also the enemy is 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 a lot of different things as well, right? It's also partly the environment, partly the people trying to, you know, influence the, you know, that sort of thing. But I mean that that's just how I feel about it. But um, but you know there, I just think there's so much because you know like while Solomon isn't uh, isn't truly very visible in a lot of these things, you can really see um, the effect she has because she's also the person who um, taught Howell everything he knows in that sense, and that's why he's under kind of like a curse from her in that sense so you have this like moment where you know you you kind of go back into the past and you kind of see like what's trapping him and like what's trapped him into this kind of body type of thing and how he's gotten to where he is right now um but uh yeah i mean that's how i feel about it but you know i mean if you think about really deeply the story itself also i you know as you were talking about as you were talking comparing it to wizard of oz i was actually thinking about a few other things that's kind of been in my mind a little is that there's a lot of like fairy tale notions here and when we think about it like they don't mention it in here but like it's not in the story itself but Sophie is very similar to Cinderella (laughs) because 
Sophie actually is married into like it's like her father in this in the book itself it starts off where her father dies and then yep. she marries a young wife who ends up having two 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 daughters also <laughs> but the sisters all get along in this version so <laughs> But then what happens is that because of because of what uh, because of um, the father dying in the end, um, someone has to be sacrificed. And Sophie, being the eldest, ends up being the one watching the hat shop. While the sisters get to be like apprenticing in other places type of thing. And that that and that to me is like a really interesting twist on something very similar to Cinderella. Obviously here it doesn't get to that extent, but um I really, you know, I really like that. And, you know, obviously there's the connection with Wizard of Oz. And then, you know, you have Turnip Head, which is, which is kind of like uh, the Frog Prince, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so you have, you have a lot of these little fairy tale elements that I, I, I kind of really like that there's so much fun to it. And, and I think that for the English version, I've never actually watched this in the actual Japanese dub. I've actually only watched it in English dub because that's where I watched it. Yeah. And the voice cast is so strong that I don't really think it would make too much of a difference because, you know, like you're looking at Sophie and Sophie is like, um, you know, young version of her is Emily Mortimer and then her old version is Gene Simmons. And then, you know, you have Christian Bale as, as, as Howell and then Calcifer is Billy Crystal, who I think does a really great job. You know, so there's a lot of like fun little moments that 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 I really like. Definitely, so enough. You uh, definitely hit hit on hit the head though. I mean, Billy Crystal is fantastic because it's a very subtle performance for a character that could be very overplayed. Yes, and he seems to know know exactly how to hit animated characters just right to be with this or like uh, Mike Rabowski in Monsters Inc or even when we look at the Annual Olympics um, film he's still constantly done a number of great animated performances and I think with Calcifer he knows just how far to push it because you have a character who's um, got a bit of a sarkiness to him and he's got this uh, underlying sort of uh, friendliness to him and it He's got uh, a vulnerability as well, but the fact that he's a fire spirit, so he can be put out, and the fact as well that he's linked so closely to Howl, um, I think it's just just really, it, it's just really touching, just like how his character his character is, and yeah, and certainly a lot in how the character moves as well, how it's just has these little movements, and a lot of them are just really subtle sort of sequences, such as like. Mm-hmm. When Howell is making the bacon and eggs and he's feeding him um, eggshells. There's yeah. a lot of fluidness to that movement. He's sort of like cracking the shells and he's like throwing them in and you see uh, Casper's mouth opening to catch the eggshells. And it's just the fluidness of that sequence is just so, it's so engaging. Yes. Um, no, I mean, arguably, I mean, the the movie itself, Calcifer is definitely one of my favorite characters. Just because he, he he's so, <laughs> you know, other than, like, the the langy dog who no one knows who it belongs to until you realize that he's kind of a traitor. <laughs> no, but, I mean, Calcifer is such a, a, is such a fun character. It kind of, like, adds a lot of... Um, a lot of entertainment entertaining moments to the movie because you know like it's like what you said his mo- movements are so good because when billy crystal does it i feel like he really kind of captures when he's like you know a strong flame or he's like having this like dramatic moment he's he kind of builds up that drama as well like the, the you know the the kind of like over the top sarcasm that he might have or you know like the the over expression or like when he's scared of something happening or whatever it's um it's really it's really fun and and in this one you know you also get the idea that even all of these spirits everyone has their own weakness you know you know like which of the ways didn't you know the her her personality and whatnot kind of you know kind of kind of got the best of her that's why she ended up you know being being tricked back into her old form uh much like calcifer whose weakness is obviously fire so he's scared to be put out and you know, and, and Sophie kind of pushes that a little bit far at one point. And, you know, like, he's not even all-powerful because he's also, he also has something that's, you know, you think he's running the the entire the entire Howl's Moving Castle, but there's something a little bit more to the whole story as well. There's this wonderful message that, you know, about life being worth living. 
uh, that we see in just about how challenges can be overcome by being compassionate to others. And this isn't the first time that we've seen this film before. We've seen it like with Ashitaka and San in Princess Mononoke and Shito and Pazu in Castle in the Sky, where you have characters learning to survive by showing compassion to others and then suddenly in this one we see it with like turn it hair holding the umbrella over Sophie's head when it rains we see how she cares for like the witch of the waste when she becomes like really yeah. old and senile and we also he, even though it's not a young character we he still manages to work in his uh, female character doing cleaning mm-hmm. because uh, Howl's Castle while it being this magical if ramshackle place is also a dump <laughs> the fact that they only have like they have two spoons and a fork because everything else is so dirty so we get to see that wonderful sequence of her like cleaning the big house and how it opens up the the whole of this moving castle which I think is just a really great way of mapping out the space uh, even though it changes constantly depending on the whims of howls and it's got like magical doors which open to different that act like a portal which is really a nice touch as well. But the the castle design itself I, I'm I'm just so obsessed with. Mm-hmm. Um and certainly that was like one of the the things that drew Miyazaki to the project. Um in the book they don't really talk too much about how it moves and he had in his idea this idea of a castle moving across the this landscape on like the chicken legs and he basically built it up from there and there's over like there's about 80 elements that make up this castle you've got turrets uh, cogs and you obviously have the legs and you also have the wagging tongue as well and Mm -hmm. while it looks obviously as a hand-drawn animation there are a lot of digital elements in this as well which obviously explains why it moves so well as it does rather than trying to do this as one complete hand drawn piece where you'd obviously potentially see those flaws even though we know that Miyazaki's a perfectionist and no doubt checking every single one of these stills by hand so just seeing this how this moves across the landscape because it's not a solid piece it's it it's almost like you have a base and everything else mm-hmm. has been stacked upon it it's like when you play like tricky towers <laughs> uh, it, it's got this sort of shakiness to it as it moves yeah. along yet yeah. it's well, like, especially because it's on these like two little chicken legs you know? yeah <laughs> like, it's like sheer force of will that keeps this thing together literally really in the case of this castle and i love as well the fact that when you get towards the end and she removes castle from it and you see the castle like crumble away and it's basically just a platform on two chicken legs and then <laughs> by the end it's just evolved into another form entirely it's now a flying castle and it's even before that how we see how how takes into consideration it's like oh we've got this larger family so we need more space and they were like we'll put a toilet in here and we see all the rooms of the castle like moving around and like appearing and stuff i thought there's just so many nice little touches here that that show how he's like taking into consideration the architecture of this building and mm-hmm. how it lo- looks in the inside and how everything sort of connects. I just just really love that. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's like the moving castle is is definitely what drew me to the film in the in the first place. Um, knowing nothing about the film, I mean, it was kind of like a spontaneous watch. <laughs> um, and the castle itself is, is, you know, like, it's something I really love so much that, you know, we're doing this recording in the office and right above my <laughs> my equipment is an art of the moving castle. <laughs> so it, it, it's just it's just so well built. You know, you see the little moment and, you know, when when all these little like chimneys and stuff that are popping out. And then at one point you when we get to see the top part is when, you know, they they come out on this balcony and then there's like turnip heads stuck in one of the little chimneys or something. And then. And you have to try and pull them out and stuff. And you see all these little things. And it, and, and it almost looks like a creature itself walking through the 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 land as it's going. Um, and it can go fast and it can go like lumbering by. And, and then you have this... Uh, and you, you also have these like little moments where there, there's so many things that you can like... It, it, it kind of feels very... It's like a character in its own. The house itself and, and that sort of thing. And, and it makes it... It makes it so so. I guess it's it's so it's so fun to just watch that, the whole castle itself. And then when you think about it, like, it's not your typical idea of what a castle is. 
You know, like castles are like, you know, arches and towers <laughs> and, you know, that sort of thing. And this one is just like this rusty iron balls and 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 and, and, and all sorts of like metallic pieces all melded together and well, yeah, I mean, certainly when you look at the book version, it's more of a tall and dark and sort of more traditional wizard's tower. Whereas when we look at the film version, it's almost pl- playing in counter to the world that it exists within. Uh, so you obviously have the fact it's all steam powered and it's fueled by magic, and you've got all these different like chimneys and roofs and steam pipes and these like jutting parts out of it now whereas everything else has got like a smoothness a efficiency to it and certainly when we look at like the flying machines which have almost got like but like fish like uh fins to them mm-hmm. how everything moves and it's got this sort of mechanicalness to it all these wonderful smooth lines and when you look at when we go into like the village and stuff everything's very sort of sort of steam powered so i love uh that it flies in in the face of this world it's sort of like it's almost defiantly sticking to the old ways by having everything sort of steam powered rather than fueled by like you know electricity or having the sort of modernization to it which i really kind of like and it as i say it goes back to that, that point we made earlier in the episode of how with this one we're seeing like technology forcing the magic world out and how's this like standing much like himself in sort of defiance of this modern world is sort of like no i'm going to be this embodiment of magic um that just wanders around the landscape for well, literally and the fact is the fact is it stumbles around on chicken legs is almost sort of adding to that sort of insult really into it sort of like rather than having it's this smooth thing i'm just going to have this like look as janky as possible or do you think that's just sort of ties in further with his sort of messy personality, the fact that, like the inside, everything's a mess. It's all sort of functional <laughs> rather than um, pristine. Well, I mean, <laughs> Howell is kind of like a imperfect per- perfectionist. <laughs> because, you know, he has a certain sequence in it. And sometimes you think about it and it's like, why is <coughs> Howell's castle so endearing in its ways? I think that it's like, it's like Howell kind of at one point feels like he's a teen of sorts. Where um, I remember in my teen days where I would, and I'm still a bit like that. And obviously now I'm married, I, I can't be that way. <laughs> but I mean, like you... There's this, like, living, you know, organized in your own mess is how I would call it. Yes. Organized chaos, so, isn't yeah, it? And, yeah. And, and for him, it's like there's one moment where, you know, Sophie cleans uh, his bathroom, hmm. which is obviously something that most people would truly enjoy other people doing because you don't want to do it. Um, and she misplaces something and then suddenly... He has a massive tantrum because his hair is a different color suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you kind of have this feeling like, you know, Howell is this like, you know, while he's this like all powering wizard, he's suddenly reduced down to this like this like uh, tantrum pulling like type of type of uh, type of character, you know, like a very like a like a teen, <laughs> like a child, you know. And even yeah, he's got point. this vainness to him, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, and I think it's almost like um, a hint at his personality in the books. He's much more of like a a womanizer in in the book, yes. whereas in the film, he's just whenever he's disappearing, he's to transfer into this bird like form to go and cause disruption to the war. So that's why it, it's kind of jarring when you first watch it. You think, oh, how's going to be like this? this presence but he's gone for a lot of the film it's just sophie keeping things together i was very very surprised when i saw this one just like how they choose to use the the character of how but then i suppose it's a Murasaki movie you shouldn't go into it expecting anything really i mean I, first time you watch my neighbor totoro you think he's going to be much more of a a, a main character than a background character that he is so Yes, I think uh, House Moving Castle, I think it's a great follow-up to Spirited Away. And I've, 
As I said, I think it stands out as definitely one of Murasaki's strongest works, if not one of my favourites. Um, I think it certainly uh, stands up, though, in that higher echelon of uh, works from Murasaki. Yeah, I mean, Howl's Moving Castle is, is, is definitely something like... Obviously, I mean, I'm a bit biased because I think it's, you know, my yes. favourite movie personally. But um, I, I think that, you know, there, there's so much to love about this, whether it's what's been changed from the adaptation to, you know, to suit the cinema and Miyazaki's style himself, but also the themes that comes out through it. There, There's a lot of imagination and creativity. Maybe not all of it is, you know, Miyazaki himself, but... Whether you're looking at the art and the visuals of Studio Ghibli and um, and 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 you know the angle that he takes on on how to kind of adapt this into the big screen, I think there's a lot of really good choices that that's done here. Certainly so. Um, it's a it's another visually stunning film, and certainly one that uh, really sort of marks Mozaki is a, a master of his domain. Really, he knows how to use animation, and he certainly here should. She has a willingness to adapt to more modern animated styles rather than sort of stick into the old ways. Um, and I think that's why he's able to have such freedom with the projects that he does. He's able to give us like huge jangling structures that walk on the landscape. He's able to tear buildings in two and have characters fall through chasms or have uh, sweeping sort of changes. So I think it's it, it's just a, a fantastic film okay. just throughout So. So that brings us into tonight's episode. Thank you, as always, for listening. If you haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to listen to us. Let us know your thoughts on the filmography of uh, Mazaki. You can get in touch with us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Come say hi to us there. And you can also check out our blog, which is Moves and Tea Podcast, WordPress.com, which has got our complete archive of episodes, including our Friday Film Club, where every Friday, myself and Kim both pick a film to highlight. And um, Kim, where are we going to next? Because we're always nearing the end of our journey with Murasaki, aren't we? So yeah, we're at the penultimate episode. Um, the next one is the 2008 Panyo, which is kind of like the Miyazaki's version of the Little Mermaid. So that's uh, going to be interesting to see that because I always felt it was kind of like a step down from. Uh, House Moving Castle and Spirited Away, but we'll obviously be able to uh, deep dive into that more when we look at it on our next episode. But until then, thank you for listening. Thanks to my co-host Kim, and we'll be back next time to talk about Ponyo. Ponyo.